Design Requirements and Stem Cell Cycling. Uh, the title of the book, uh, or the title of the talk comes from an article by Chang et al. Control of C. elegans germline cells, uh, stem cell cycling speed meets requirements of design to minimize mutation accumulation. Um, I found it interesting that it meets the requirements of design and uh, and the design is to minimize mutation accumulation. It is available on the internet although it's in a preliminary form and as we'll see um, the PDF uh, will probably be improved before it's all over. The provisional abstract um, starts out with background. Stem cells are thought to play a critical role in minimizing the accumulation of mutations, but it is not clear which strategies they follow to fulfill that performance objective. Slow cycling of stem cells provides a simple strategy that can minimize cell pedigree depth and therefore thereby minimize the accumulation of replication-dependent mutations. Although the power of this strategy was recognized early on, a quantitative assessment of whether and how it is employed by biological systems is missing. So they're going to provide that. Results here, we address this problem using a simple self-renewing organ, organ, the C. elegans gonad. Uh, C. elegans is a worm uh, whose picture is at the bottom of the frame. Um, whose overall organization is shared with many self-renewing organs. Computational simulations of mutation accumulation characterize a trade-off between fast development and low mutation accumulation and show that slow cycling cell stem cells allow for an advantageous compromise to be reached. This compromise is such that worm germline stem cells should cycle more slowly than the differentiating counterparts, but only by a modest amount. Experimental measurements of cell cycle lengths derived using a new quantitative technique are consistent with these predictions. Now, uh, let me just go back and uh, point out these hyphens. And uh, in the uh, PDF abstract, you'll see the hyphens are gone. I assume that those spaces mean that there's something there, though. And in the provisional abstract, which does have background stem cells, it looks like they've just simply jammed everything together and also has results here, we, right here. Yeah. So, so I put those in white because I know that those belong there. Uh, but there are a lot of other ones like that that um, I don't know for sure, so I'm guessing. And if you see stuff in yellow, that's stuff I put in, uh, figuring that that's what belonged there. Conclusions are findings shed light on both design principles that underline the role of uh, stem cells in delaying aging and on evolutionary forces that shape st stem cell gene regulatory networks. Now, as we go through, look for the evolutionary forces that shape, shape stem cell gene regulatory networks. Also look for the design features. Background. Mutation accumulation is thought to drive aging, carcinogenesis, and the increased incidence of birth defects with parental age. Just to name three things. That is to say, mutation accumulation is not a good thing in general. And intricate cell machinery maintains the genome by detecting and repairing both DNA lesions and replication errors strongly suggesting that minimization of mutation accumulation is an important performance objective for cells and organisms. We don't like mutation accumulation and we'll do everything we can to minimize it. Uh, I'm not reading everything, um, but uh, 
because if I did, it would take too long. Yet both eukaryotes and prokaryotes accumulate mutations at a, higher, a rate higher than set by physical limits. As shown strikingly in the case of prokaryotes by the existence of anti-mutator mutants with lower mutation rates than the wild type. In other words, you can actually get lower mutation rates. But they're not the wild type, which means that um, uh, the wild type must be able to outcompete them because of some advantage. Although in the case of some eukaryotes, higher than optimal mutation rates are likely to do in part to low population sizes causing genetic drift. Maybe it's just chance for some things. A more general possible explanation is that genome maintenance comes at a substantial cost in terms of metabolic resources or delays in DNA replication, or of course both. Strategies that do not incur a strong metabolic or speed penalty would thus likely be actively sought out by evolution. So you have two goals, and they're partly contradictory to each other. And the question is, where do you strike a balance where both goals are best uh, uh, um, are optimally uh, optimal with regard to each other? Stem cells are expected to play a major role in strategies to minimize the accumulation of mutations in tissue. Since stem cells stand at the top of cell lineages, they can help minimize this accumulation by maintaining a high quality genome and periodically refreshing a pool of cells that accumulate mutations at a higher rate but are only transiently present in the tissue. So you have stem cells, they'll make other cells that will multiply but those will only multiply to a certain extent and then they will stop multiplying so the stem cells can multiply slower and make less mistakes in their uh, reproduction of DNA. Stem cells can maintain a high quality genome in essentially two ways. One possibility is for stem cells to be intrinsically more resistant to mutation accrual. Maybe they have more of the repair enzymes or something. Another independent possibility is for stem cells to simply cycle less frequently and therefore incur fewer replication-dependent mutations over the organism's lifespan. Asking whether and how organisms implement this strategy, which was proposed by Cairns, requires a theoretical approach to ask how it should be implemented in practice and an experimental approach to ask whether theoretical predictions are met. So they're going to try both of those in this article. Previous studies they mention, and then they say, because both mutation minimization and speed of development are performance objectives relevant to biological systems. They're using language that, that comes from uh, engineering. Here we ask how the slow stem cell cycling principle outlined by Karen applies when considering these objectives jointly. The model self-renewing organism we use for this purpose, the C. elegans hermaphroditic germline, is such that both performance ob objections are accessible as detailed below. The C. elegans germline, and I forgot to italicize that, provides a stem cell model system that is highly amenable to stem cell cycle studies. This germline is contained in two black gonadal arms with stem cells located at the distal end within a mitotic zone. The stem cells ensure self-renewal throughout life, compensating for cell loss to spermatogenesis, which occurs during larval development, and oogenesis and apoptosis that occur during adulthood. So apparently the, the uh, worm produces sperm first, and then later on will produce the eggs that will be fertilized by the sperm. And the sperm just kind of sit there and wait until it's until the eggs come along. And uh, here's the figure one, which um, uh, shows the stem cells at the distal uh, distal most metabolic zone. I guess they didn't like DMZ because it sounded too. Uh, 
too much like demilitarized zone. Um, the uh, medial mitotic zone and the proximal mitotic zone. And I would have thought of this as proximal and this as distal, but that's apparently the way they look at things. Um, and the mitotic zone is, notice it's specified to about 260 cells. Like exactly. Yes. Uh, go ahead and speak into the mic. You see how these cells all fold under? Are, are both of those moving in the same direction or do they go this way and then over this way? They apparently, they apparently make a U-turn at the end. Uh, at that end? At that end. Okay. Over here. Yeah. Now, why, I'm not sure I can tell you. But in fact, if you see these large cells, you can see some of them lining up right here and then going up into there. Well, well, I was thinking about the little ones. The, the little ones start at this end and go all the way there and then turn around and come this way. That's right. That's right. Um, and you'll notice that there's a couple of uh, hormone levels that they show. Uh, some kind of factor here, uh, GLD. Uh, there's actually two different FBFs, FBF1 and FBF2. Um, and apparently they uh, go more or less together. Um, and then this was CYE1, which is influenced by both of those, tends to peak in the middle and then come down to nearly zero by the time we get to the <coughs> what they call the meiotic zone. There's a differentiation and meiosis occurs in this area here. So do they say anything why the ap apoptosis happens? Um, well, they propose there's two possibilities. One of them is that certain cells turn into nurse cells rather than actual oocytes, and then when they're done, they off themselves, so to speak. Um, uh, the other possibility is that certain cells uh, have enough metabol or enough DNA defects that the cell says, you know, we really should make oocytes out of the good ones instead of the not so good ones. And so there may be some uh, deliberate destruction of cells that just aren't cut out, are, are defective. So we don't really know for sure. Um, and that's an area where I suppose somebody could do some research. In fact, they propose that we do so. The mitotic zone contains cycling cells and expresses factors driving the cell cycle, such as the worm homolog of cyclin E, which is discovered in other than worm, CYE-1. Throughout the 20 cells, the, uh, cell rows that it spans. Uh, the mitotic zone is patterned along its distal proximal axis, notably by counteracting gradients of the pumilio homologs FBF1 and FBF2, which promote the stem cell fate, and of factors such as GLD1 that promote differentiation. And uh, as you get further out, there's less and less FBF1 and FBF2, and there's more uh, GLD1. These factors define steps of differentiation within the mitotic zone at rows 6 to 8 and 12, more or less, from the distal end, uh, before the overt my meiosis observed at row 20. So that's the meiotic zone starts there. Cells do not undergo active migration from one zone to the other, but rather are displaced along the distal proximal axis. The differentiation state progresses accordingly. In other words, as you keep multiplying cells, the other cells are pushed out. The spatial layers of the mitotic zone, layout of the mitotic zone is important because it obviates the need for fine markers to assay differentiation states. Distance to the distal end is a reliable differentiation marker. There's, otherwise, you'd have to determine what each cell was doing. And because it makes it straightforward to assay the proliferative contribution to the tissue of all cell subpopulations, 
Although no spatial differentiation in the cell cycle length were found in previous studies, variation in M phase index hints at different cell cycle behavior along the distal proximal axis. And they're going to point out that now we have found um, a difference in the way it multiplies. Because of its predominantly selfing mode of, re uh, mode of rep reproduction, that is, it usually fertilizes itself, the C. elegans mutation rate is expected to be low. A high mutation rate would have led to rapid extinction of the species by our Mueller's ratchet. Um, in other words, mutations don't lead to new wonderful organisms. They lead to death of the uh, organism. Indeed, the C. elegans mutation rate was found to be around 3 times 10 to the minus 9th or 10 around 10 to the minus 8th, depending on which, uh, which reference you're talking about, per site per generation. Slightly lower than the human rate. And if you're wondering, that means that there's an average of slightly less than one per worm. Uh, yes, that, in fact, that should have been a, a dash, I think, 37. Oh, I see. So 33. To and, um, and that's one I didn't pick up and put in. And the, com the computer just is taking those and, and omitting gotcha. them. So um, that's, I, I didn't pick that up. Um, the C. elegans gonad thus provides a highly suitable model system to ask how organs minimize the accumulation of mutations and what role stem cells play in that minimization. So it's been designed to make very few mutations, um, less than one per organism. To address the role of stem cells in minimizing mutation accumulation, we built models of cell cycling and mutation accrual and optimize their parameters computationally. We find that when taking into account constraints on speed of development and reproduction, C. elegans germline stem cells should cycle more slowly than the differentiating counterparts, but the difference should be only about twofold. Using a new quantitative analysis technique, we show that this prediction is borne out experimentally. We further show that slower stem cell, stem cell cycling could be due to, at least in part, to fine-tuning along the distal proximal axis of expression of the cell cycle regulator CYE1, consistent with the previously identified motif in the germline gene regulatory network whose potential significance is highlighted, highlighted by our approach. Now, it may not turn out to be that it's entirely, and it may turn out to be that it's CYE1 is just a chance, but CYE1 apparently has the power to do this, and it does seem to be uh, distributed in a way that would allow less cycling early on and more cycling as you get further out. Results. Slow cycling progenitors can mimic replication-dependent mutations by balancing pedigree trees. Um, Skipping a little, accumulation of replication-dependent mutations is best understood by considering the pedigree of all cells that descend from the primordial progenitor. This pedigree forms a structure known in computer science as a binary tree, where the, in this case each cell has either zero or two descendants. In other words, it either splits before it dies or it dies before it splits. And here is a perfectly distributed pedigree where every single cell has only three uh, progenitors. Here is a perfectly lopsided pedigree, which means a beta is 0 0.5, which is the ideal beta. Um, beta is calculated using the average of the number of, uh, in, in the range. Here's one that, where it's as low as it is theoretically possible to be for this size, and that is you have one that splits off and keeps giving N cells. And of course, you could get it even lower if you had a longer chain. 
And then here's one where you're producing cells, some of which happen fairly early, some of which happen evenly, and some of which happen um, a little later. But because uh, you're having the, the pedigree starting, uh, th this will give you some cells that will actually work early on. And it will give you more cells that work later. And it will give you more cells that work later. But the later ones don't have a, an arm like seven. It's more like four in front of uh, these two. And um, these are some more uh, plots of how cells could divide. In this, the mitotic zone actually shrinks to this only one. That is, these ones don't multiply at all. And here, the mitotic zone, these ones multiply 1.3 times as, as frequently as these ones do. So that's relatively preserving the stem cells, which are in red, but um, and allowing them to work more slowly. Um, and here's one where the stem cells don't multiply very much at all, and now the new mitotic zone takes over almost all of the work. And uh, in that case, why your, uh, your depth goes from 4.5 to 3.5 to 3.75. So you have a better, a greater advantage to having something that's sort of moderately in between the extremes of D and, and F. And it depends on how many cells you have where the ideal range for that alpha is. Um, we define the pedigree depth of a cell as the number of divisions separating cell from the primordial germ cell. The average number of replication dependent mutations in an organ is then proportional to the average pedigree depth. Average pedigree depth is minimized when trees are balanced, that is, when no pairs of cells at the bottom of the tree have pedigree depths that differ by more than one. The performance of cell cycle control strategies in terms of replication-dependent mutation accumulation can thus be assayed by the balance in the cell pedigree trees that they produce. The strategy that minimizes pedigree depth and thus replication-dependent mutation accumulation has significant drawbacks. The strategy produces a balanced pedigree tree by maintaining an expanding pool of progenitors in which all cells keep cycling at the same rate until the time the organ has reached its final set of cells. It precludes a differentiation of cells before that time so that nothing can function until you've got everything in place. It requires a large pool of progenitors and is impractical for organs that must undergo self-renewal throughout life. It's nice if you can just form the organ and let it sit there, like the brain. But it's not so nice if, you're, if you have an organ that needs to reproduce cells every now and then because it loses uh, something like the liver or like the lining of the gut, which has to be re replaced every so often. Early cell differentiation in small progenitor pools are made possible by the naive alternative strategy that consists of maintaining a lineage of asymmetrically dividing, dividing progenitors. But this comes at the cost of an unbalanced pedigree tree and thus increased pedigree depth, especially later on. A third strategy is possible that compromises between the two previous strategies. A population of long-lived, slow-cycling progenitors divides asymmetrically to self-renew and to give rise to faster-cycling progenitors that only pres persist transiently before differentiating. This strategy, to which we refer as the pedigree depth quasi-minimization strategy hereafter, can lead to a highly balanced pedigree tree while allowing early production of differentiated cells and small progenitor pool sizes. In other words, it has the best of both worlds. Organ spatial structure and cell cycle length distribution can be exploited for beneficial shaping of pedigree trees. And uh, basically, it's 
saying that uh, that the organ that we're looking at is designed so that spatial position actually influences the uh, rapidity of uh, reproduction of the cells. And about a twofold slowdown in stem cell cycle length optimizes C. elegans germline muta mutation accumulation. So in this particular model, the C. elegans germline, um, they can decrease the mutation accumulation more or less optimally given their contradictory uh, poles uh, by about a twofold slowdown in, in cell cycle um, uh, by the stem cells themselves as opposed to the cells they give rise to. And they asked, what is the optimal compromise between minimization of mutation accumulation and early production of differentiated cells? And what is the resulting optimal stem cell cycling speed? The answers to these questions depend on the relative cost of mutation accumulation and of delaying the production of differenti differentiated cells. And they go into that. We tackle this problem within the context of C. elegans hermaphroditic gonadal arm which over the reproductive lifetime of an individual produces 3,000 cells, more or less, that differentiate by entering meiosis. Cells leaving the mitotic zone ensure compensation of germ cell loss to apoptosis and gametogenesis, that is, the cells either die or produce eggs or sperm, maintaining a gonadal arm cell numbers at a roughly steady state of about 1,000 during adulthood. The germline mutation rate is low. Um, and timing of reproduction is critical to worm fitness. Therefore, both minimization of mutation accumulation and early production of differentiated cells are important performance objectives for the worm germ germline. We use simulations outlined in box one and detailed in methods. I'm not going to go into those. Uh, the length of the mitotic cell cycle is modeled as a linear gradient varying from 2.8 hours at the proximal edge of the my mitotic zone to a value of the distal end that was free to vary, that's the front end, remember, that was free to vary at a minimum of, above a minimum of 2.8 hours. And why did they select 2.8 hours is because it's the shortest cycle length that they observed experimentally during germline development. Thus, this simulation had six free parameters. Mitotic zone width and length. Now notice that that's only one parameter because if you make the width wider, then the length becomes shorter and vice versa. Sampled such that the total mitotic cell number was no more than 2,000. Um, and distal cell cycle length for each development stage. These six parameters were optimized as described in methods to minimize pedigree depth of the first 3,000 differentiated cells. The minimal pedigree depth achieved with a uh, mitotic zone comprising 359 cells was 11.74. And um, they give you the references for where they calculated that. This is close to the theoretical minimum of, of 11.55. So it's pretty close to optimal in that regard. Uh, skipping over a few things, the cell cycle speed varies 1.5 fold along the distal proximal axis. The average ratio of cell cycle speeds between the distal, meta, uh, distal most meta, um, mitotic zone and proximal medial mitotic, middle, yeah, medial mitotic zone was 1.50. And they bootstrapped that to the, the range is 1.26 to 1.67 and 1.53, which again, the range is even wider, 1.20 to 1.90, at the L4 and L4 plus one day stages respectively. So it varies a little bit depending on the stage of the worm. One more day makes the, uh, uh, makes the ratio just a little bit uh, higher. 
although certainly not statistically significant. Importantly, this result is supported by two independent analysis techniques, one based on the fraction of labeled mitosis, our FLM, which we'll see in the next slide, which has been used before without distinguishing between subpopulations along the distal proximal axis. And the new technique we report based on DNA content histograms, which is called DNA earth movers distance, or DEMD, that makes use of all cells instead of only rare M phase cells. The fraction of labeled mitosis has to use mitosis as the uh, uh, as the as one of the variables, and that means that you can only count uh, mitotic phase cells for that particular. Um, and you'll see that there's there's quite a variability, but they do tend to cluster around. Um, uh, certain areas, and you'll notice that the areas for both of them are pretty close to each other. Um, the, those ovals contain 95% of the data. That uh, the scattered data is one point is easier to see than the than the uh, denser uh, collections of data, and the same way for L, L4 and L4 plus one day gives you the same general plot. Now, this is the ratio of uh, how fast the cells are dividing. The uh, G1 is a um, traditional name. It's a gap one. It's uh, an area where the cell is just kind of sitting there with only one set of DNA. The S is where it's synthesizing a second set, and the G2 is where it's sitting there resting um, between the second set uh, of DNA being produced and the actual splitting of the cell in mitosis at the very top. Mitosis includes a traditional prophase, anaphase, metaphase, telophase, etc. Uh, where the chromosomes first line up and then separate into uh, different parts of the cell. So this mitotic phase is extremely active in separating everything. And you can see how much time it takes to produce DNA. And these are some of the fastest cycling um, cells. Uh, you'll notice that uh, this one comes down to around, around three days, which is very close to the 2.8 days that uh, is the maximum speed. Uh, at this point, the larva is moving as fast as it can, basically. Um, you'll notice that as we get here, it tends to be that the, the S phase stays more or less the same, but the M2 phase, during which the, uh, during which the uh, DNA can be proofread, is, uh, uh, is getting significantly longer. Therefore, our experimental analysis verified the theoretical prediction that a two-fold cycle speed gradient should exist along the distal proximal axis. It's actually, to be fair, it's more like 1.5 instead of 2. A cyclin E gradient exists in the distal uh, mitotic zone that does not depend on cell cycle phase. And then they get to the discussion. Potential alternative explanations for slow stem cell cycling. Since our quantitative predictions match experimental data closely, the pedigree depth quasi-minimization strategy is a strong candidate to explain how the speed of stem cell cycling was tuned by evolution. And if you want to know, that's one of the few places in the article where it actually used the word evolution. But it has to be tuned by evolution because what other alternative is there? Um, other strategies to minimize mutation accumulation. We note that there are a number of strategies other than the cell cycle control to minimize mutation accumulation. Another potential strategy is asymmetric segregation of 
immortal strands of DNA by stem cells. By retaining the unreplicated uh, DNA strands at each division, stem cells could segregate replication errors to their differentiating descendants and thus suppress the accumulation of mutations in the cell, stem cell compartment. So that is to say, every time you divide, you keep the, you keep the old strand separate. Of course, that would uh, require differentiating between the old and the new strand on two-stranded DNA. That would be one way of doing it. This strategy has been proposed to apply in different contexts to all chromosomes, some chromosomes, or not at all. So there's some dif uh, dispute in the literature as to how common this is. How does the pedigree depth quasi-minimization strategy interact with the immortal strand strategy, which does not rely on control of cell cycle length? Our results show that if this strategy were followed by the C. elegans germline, the cell cycle length profiles should be very different from those we observed experimentally. That is, stem cells, which would not accumulate mutations, except for random error, uh, should cycle quickly. In other words, everything should be taken off of the good copy. For organs that rely on a large pool of stem cells, if an immortal strand strategy applies slow cycling of cells at the top of the lineage hierarchy would be beneficial as the stem cell pool expands during development. But once the stem cell apartment is fully developed, stem cells would cycle quickly. So what you do is you produce a whole bunch of stem cells and then as, um, as soon as they're all in order, then you start using them as templates and start spewing out cells from the stem cells. An independent strategy to minimize the accumulation of mutations, whether they were incurred from errors in DNA replication or not, is for cells that acute mutations to senesce or undergo apoptosis. That is, they get old or they die, or maybe both. In the C. elegans germline, extensive apoptosis occurs in older adults. While this apoptosis could be explained by elimination of nurse cells or the need to reduce competition between developing germ cells, it appears that apoptosis could preferentially eliminate damaged cells in certain contexts. So that's one of the suggestions that maybe just the bad cells are destroyed. This idea could be further explored in the future with tools to estimate the mutational load in populations of cells before and after they have been purged of apoptotic cells. So you check them all, and then you let in another organism, obviously. You check them all after a certain amount of apoptosis has, ha has taken place, and you see whether the ones with apoptosis uh, or after apoptosis are more pure than the originals. Extension to other organs. The pedigree depth quasi-minimization strategy extends to other tissues. In the following, we consider three differences between the C. elegans gonad and other self-renewing organs that are relevant to pedigree depth quasi-minimization. First, a difference with many vertebrate organisms, vertebrate organs is speed of development. While small developmental delays are expected to have a strong deleterious effect on fitness in an organism with a short lifestyle, any boom-bust lifestyle such as C. elegans, that is to say, all of a sudden it can grow very well and then it kind of doesn't grow very well um, and perhaps barely survives, they are likely to have a smaller impact on organisms with a longer life cycle. Such organisms are thus expected to favor low mutation accumulation over high speed of development. If the, you're always going to be able to grow, then you grow more slowly so that you can do it right the first time, um, at least to some extent, since pedigree depth quasi-minimization will come at a lessened cost. Notably, however, it has been proposed that the development of mouse intestinal crypts is designed to minimize the time of formation, to formation of a mature crypt. This strongly suggests 
that the trade-off we have investigated between mutation minimization and speed of development is of broader relevance, uh, is a broad relevance to animals other than C. elegans. And that presumably would extend to humans who have intestinal crypts somewhat similar to those of mice. Second, a large difference lies in the number of cells to be produced over an individual's lifetime. With the C. elegans gonadal arm producing a approximately 3,000 cells, and a human testis or hematopoietic system over 10 to the 12th and 10 to the 15th, respectively. So we're talking about a trillion cells versus a quadrillion cells versus 3,000 cells, quite a bit of difference. Third, organ, different organs may have different optimal distributions of mutations in the cells that they produce. The mutation frequency in C. elegans is low, about one, uh, 0 0.3 to 1 new mutation per progeny, which is why I said less than 1, suggesting that the problem of multiple mutations per progeny might not be of practical relevance. Quantification of mutation distributions in progeny from old hermaphrodites could confirm this, or provide data to guide modification to the performance objective. Overall, the pedigree depth quasi-minimization strategy is of broad relevance, but would gain from being fine-tuned once the combined effect of multiple mutations carried by the same cell are better understood. Multiple mutations by the same cell probably has something to do with cancer, among other things. Control of the cell cycle length to minimize pedigree depth. Lengthening of G2 in preference to other cell cycle phases is consistent with mutation minimization. As is replicated chromosomes, as replicated chromosomes offer the possibility of error-free damage repair with homologous recombination using the sister chromatid. Say so you've got a bad copy, but you have another good copy right next to it, so you can take the good copy and make and and copy it off into the bad copy, which now has uh, its uh, error gone. Regulation of G2 length has been reported in other contexts. Why S phase would be lengthened as well as G2 when germline transitions, when germlines transition to the adult stage is less clear. We speculate that longer S phases could be less error prone because it allows more time for error free repair before translation synthesis occurs. S phase could be shorter during larval development because the benefits of faster development outweigh the cost of decreased DNA replication fidelity. And there's a certain point you're going too slow and even though you get there, you get there uh, not as rapidly as you should. Overall, it appears that there is a complex interplay between the cell cycle machinery and regulators of differentiation. The design principles highlighted in this study, the design principle highlighted in this study provides one potential reason for the need for fine cell cycle control as cells proceed through differ differentiation. Conclusions to address the role of cell stem cells in minimizing mutation accumulation, we built models of cell cycling and mutation accrual and optimize their parameters computationally, we found that when taking into account constraints on speed of development and reproduction, C. elegans germline cells should cycle more slowly than their differentiating counterparts, but that the difference should be only approximately twofold. We additionally pre predicted optimal MZ uh, mitotic zone size dimensions of 19 to 12 cell rows. I would have said 12 to 19, but maybe they're thinking of in terms of um, what happens um, as time goes on. Using a new quantitative analysis technique, we showed that our predictions were borne out experimentally. Our results provide the first quantitative test of the slow stem cell cycling strategy originally proposed by reference nine. These results strongly support the idea that a mutation minimization is a relevant performance objective now notice, mutation minimization is a relevant performance objective. That means we'd really like to not have too many mutations. 
although alternative interpretations remain possible, and highlight an important limitation in the slow cycling strategy. We further show that slower stem cell cycling could be due, at least in part, to fine-tuning along the distal proximal axis of expression of the cell cycle regulator CYE1, consistent with the presence of a previously identified motif in the germline gene regulatory network whose potential significance is highlighted by our approach. I'm going to show you one more figure before we go. You notice that this is staining for CYE1 and how it's concentrated in the, dis in the distal mycotic zone and tends to be less in the proximal. And here is some quantitative um, numbers for that. Now, there's a lot of scatter there, so uh, you'd have to say, you know, maybe they don't, don't all look quite that good. Uh, what would be even more interesting would be to have lines between each of those data points to show which ones are in the same um, creature. And uh, this just simply shows that DNA is being produced in the same places that have CYE1. Well, here, here, and here. However, to be fair, DNA seems to be in this, which looks like corresponds to dark spot. DNA seems to be here, which also corresponds to dark spot. DNA, uh, this one is debatable. Uh, and here's, here's two of them together that look like they correspond to dark spots. So I'm not sure that you can make quite the case that it's exactly identical. Anyway, my take on this is that one needs to be careful not to overstate the paper's conclusions too much. It would be really easy to say, ah, they have proved. Um, the match between theory and experiment is only confidently with about, within about 20%, more or less. Uh, and I'm not sure that that's good enough for us to be able to say, oh, this is definitely what's going on. Although, and, and we, because of that, we may have the, actually the wrong theory, or we may have a right theory, but there are two theories that are going on that, that both feed into this, and that's why the match isn't as good as it could be. But it does appear likely that the theory is the best that's been put forward so far. Um, that being said, C. elegans appears to be put together in such a way that its design is optimized for reducing mutations while still maturing rapidly. Um, as the paper put it, the design principle highlighted in this study provides one potential reason for the need for fine cell cycle control as cells proceed toward differentiation. There's a design principle here. Now, of course, the authors presumably will say that evolution did it. Whereas, there is, of course, another possibility for the designer who put that design in. Um, it is also interesting that the Reduction of mutations is considered a design objective. Now, most of the time, mutations are thought to be the raw material of evolution. Right? So, C. elegans appears to have been designed not to evolve. <laughs> Think about that. The evo if evolution produced this system, then the evolution essentially uh, drove the system to minimize further progress of evolution. That's what it looks like. I is that not the implication of this? So we could call that the end of evolution? So does that mean that evolution comes to ultimately a conclusion? from which it doesn't go any further. Maybe, uh, the, maybe people a million years from now will still look like us. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> go ahead. Well, uh, the, the idea is you have to have evolution <clears throat> But uh, 
if you evolve something for design, that's evolution also. Of course, of course, because what else is there? Uh, no matter what results you come up with, often uh, it's attributed to, to evolution. And you have cases, you know, where uh, opposite results are attributed to evolution. One of the more common ones is being man's aggression. Uh, versus altruism. Ver versus uh, altruism. Uh, man is accused of evolved aggressive, well, it's from his ancestors who are aggressive and he's altruistic. Uh, because that's, uh, you know, uh, what, what we face. Uh, these are two opposite characteristics, both attributed to evolution. And you can have the same situation here. Um, which means evolution predicts everything, and uh, therefore, in a sense, it predicts nothing. Um, I guess I could ask the question as we uh, open it up, is this the origin of stasis? Doesn't it imply Uh, well, what we see is apparently a self-stabilizing system. Yeah, and uh, uh, and it, it's it's remarkable that uh, that this would happen. Of course, if you were a designer, you might want a self-stabilizing system. Uh, uh, why evolution would come to this conclusion is not totally clear. Apparently, C. elegans is a dead end. What would be interesting to see is if other worms with the same general uh, uh, body plan and so forth also had this feature, in which case it ra raises the question of how do you populate the worm population? Uh, how do you get from one original worm to a whole bunch of worms in this, in this way? Just a minute, let's uh, get this recorded here. The idea of having an article with the word design in it, is that a, a novel occurrence? Is, is this a change? Is this, or? It seems to be the evolution. Yeah, as long as evolution did it, apparently you can do that. Uh, although design is getting more and more common in, in articles of this kind. Because, I mean, what can you say? It looks, like, it looks like it fits what you would do if you were sitting down to engineer this thing. But, as, you know, they, you notice they threw in the word evolution once. I read it in context. And it really didn't say anything other than, well, this is, you know, this is how it happened, so... So I guess that nobody can accuse him of being creationist. I would simply uh, raise the question here, you know, evolution is so desperate for mutations, uh, let alone mutations that are meaningful in terms of the geologic time, which is way too short for what they, what they need. Uh, this seems to, you know, be anti. That makes that problem worse. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, you've got, well, let's say 1%, that's being, of course, very conservative, of the difference between, uh, you know, humans and chimpanzees has changed in 5 million years. That's an awful lot of mutations. And, of course, as we've seen, if you look at the human Y chromosome, it's way more than 1%. It's more like 30% plus a whole bunch of rearrangement. So uh, there's a lot of things that are, you know, this is making that mathematical problem worse because here's C. elegans that is deliberately keeping it down to less than one mutation per animal, which means that you know, if the animal puts out two new animals each time, um, 
and the worst one dies, and the worst one is, in fact, uh, the mutant one, uh, that you can keep the line pure all the way from wherever to now. You only have half half a billion years, uh, 500,000, I mean 500 million, or, to evolve most of the plant and animal kingdoms. And you have these huge changes and you have, it looks like C. elegans is deliberately on a, so to speak, a peak. It's kind of like a terminal yeah, and it's not moving. Uh, and uh, and then now, can you get from C. elegans to let's say roundworm, hookworm, whatever? I wonder. I wonder if this might also be uh, true of all these hmm, um, living fossils which presumably should have been extinct 50 or 100 or two or 300 million years ago, but have the audacity to be very much alive and still uh, not significantly different. And things uh, like horseshoe crabs and yeah, ginkgo yeah. trees yeah, 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 and yeah. stuff like uh, that. Yes, and a variety of fish and such. You know, uh, for example, uh, Coelacanth is supposed to have been dated to, what is it, 300 million years ago or something. Um, and you, you can do diving tours to study it, <laughs> you know, yeah. in real setting. Uh, and what's and more amazing is that they disappear from the uh, fossil record somewhere between 60 and 80 million yeah, years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, and then re uh, have and the audacity to just resurrect, strangely. This is most fascinating. Uh, and this is not just one species, but there are uh, Tuatara is another, Willemi pine among plants, for example, is another. Uh, I mean, the, stri the list seems to keep going on. I mean, so, so the question is, if the dating is correct, and these organisms have been here for a remarkably long time in essentially an unchanged state. The question is, how is it that they have managed to avoid evolution? Uh, and, and then, or, the, then the and, real question And the is usual answer has been, for whenever I've raised this question, people say, oh, they had a privileged niche. I said, I'd love to have a niche like that that would last for, what is it, a hundred or so million years. That's remarkable. Yeah, in some cases that privileged huh? niche apparently uh, survived things like asteroids hitting the... Yeah, yeah. How do you accomplish such a privileged niche? <laughs> how shall I say? By chance. I mean, that's like winning lotteries, not just once or twice, but every single day for a year. Even that would seem trivial in comparison. It's, it's a problem. It's a huge problem. Well, I guess we will finish on time, it looks like. Uh, Come back next week and we'll talk about Pluto. Hope your brother can come. Actually, I'd love to have him do the talk, but <laughs> I don't know if he has the time to do it. At any rate, he can come and critique it and probably add something to it.